Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast, first episode of 2013. I'm back after a break in the action. Today we're going to continue on with our History of Hong Kong Overview, Part 8. Hong Kong is now liberated from the Japanese, and it's a new beginning there. Other than inflation, a shortage of hard currency, unemployment, looting, abysmal health and hygiene conditions, insufficient housing, intimidation from triads, and 80% of the Hong Kong people being malnourished. Other than all that, the place was still standing and ready to make a quick and miraculous comeback. After eight months of military administration, beginning with Cecil Harcourt in August 1945, Sir Mark Young returned to Hong Kong, landing at Queen's Pier on May Day 1946 to restore civilian administration and begin picking up the pieces. For those eight months prior to Young's arrival, Hong Kong had been run by the colonial secretary, David Mercer MacDougall, who hailed from Perth in Scotland. He had quite an interesting life. At the Battle of Hong Kong, he made a daring escape from certain death at the hands of the Japanese. He made a break with a bunch of fellow intel officers and went on to make it to Chongqing, where the nationalist government had reconstituted itself. MacDougall later traveled the Burma Road and worked in Burma until the end of the war. MacDougall was on hand when Harcourt accepted the surrender from the Japanese, and he served excellently in the interim until Governor Young was able to sit behind his desk again in the governor's mansion. It was a new age in Hong Kong. First of all, the British had lost a massive amount of prestige in the eyes of the Hong Kong people when they were so quickly overwhelmed by the Japanese in 1941. The British, of all people, when they sailed into Hong Kong themselves a century before, who could have ever thought in a million years these guys could be beat. That they fell so quickly and because the suffering of the people of Hong Kong under the Japanese was so terrible, it all reflected badly on Great Britain in general and British rule of Hong Kong in particular. But an amazing thing happened. Right after the war ended and right after the British sort of reasserted themselves, the economy began to come back. Once the monetary and banking systems were reassembled, it had an instant impact on Hong Kong's economy and finances. This was due in part by the work carried out by the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, who were instrumental in restoring the Hong Kong currency, which was refloated at 16 Hong Kong dollars to the British pound sterling. While the rest of the world, well, not the United States so much, tried to stage some sort of a comeback from the destruction of World War II? Hong Kong had no such trouble. Considerable damage had been done during the war years, but maybe because it's such a small place like Singapore, it was easier to bounce back. A year after the Japanese had been kicked out, the economy was booming. As for the Japanese in Hong Kong after the war, the war crimes trial sentenced to death 21 of the worst offenders. 85 were given lengthy prison sentences. 14 others were acquitted, and many others escaped any kind of prosecution. As I mentioned last episode, Sir Mark Young tried to take the bull by the horns and came up with a plan that called for more directly elected legislators. His plan called for the Hong Kong government, at least the legislative part, to be more democratic and allow the Hong Kong people, meaning the Hong Kong Chinese people, to have more of a say in who was elected to the government's highest offices. As I said, this didn't go down too well. It simply couldn't get enough traction in the halls of power where it mattered. It was a classic case of quiet bureaucratic resistance and behind-the-scenes discussions. In the end, it was believed the local Hong Kong Chinese, no matter what, were always going to side with China. There was simply no way to stop it. That's where all the Hong Kong Chinese came from. Therefore, it was considered highly risky to give power to the people. What would happen to the current system? So it never happened. The British knew they'd be marginalized at the first opportunity. They saw no need to share this power yet. Governor Young left about a year after his return. 
In May 1947, he was gone, and the next governor of Hong Kong was Sir Alexander Grantham. He would stay for 10 years and be the one to oversee this post-war transformation taking place. No streets or parks named after him that I know of, although there is a uh, Grantham Hospital. As for the British in Hong Kong, it was never the same again. Those old traditional colonial attitudes that had been reluctantly accepted for a hundred years suddenly weren't so acceptable anymore. One of the first things to go was the peak ordinances that prohibited Chinese from buying property on the peak. It was a new world that emerged from the World War II years, and there was simply no going back to the pre-war society. And as far as Hong Kong was concerned, this was especially so. So, where doors were closed to Chinese and commerce and government administration, suddenly they were flung wide open now. Up until World War II, Hong Kong's role in the big picture of global trade was as a trading entrepot. The way it worked was China-made goods exited the country via any number of ports, stretching from Dalian to Guangzhou. Hong Kong was just one of these many ports. Because Guangdong province had always been such a leading powerhouse of manufacturing in China, Hong Kong enjoyed a particular advantage being located adjacent to such an immense manufacturing center. This is what initially made Hong Kong, this trading, buying and selling merchandise, natural resources, foodstuffs, you name it. These Hong Kong trading companies, from Jardines down to the smallest, Pipao Gongsi, bought these goods from China that were made or grown there and sold this stuff to importers from other countries. These Hong Kong traders also would import stuff themselves that they knew China needed and they exported to China, always acting as middlemen. Less than 30% of Hong Kong's exports to the world were actually made there. Now, this dynamic was all about to change. As you may recall from the previous episode, amidst all the chaos going on in China with the KMT and the communists fighting each other and millions getting caught up in the carnage, then with the Japanese invaded, a lot of China's more entrepreneurial and ambitious factory men pulled up stakes in China and moved lock, stock, and four smoking barrels to Hong Kong. And this was how Hong Kong began to take off as a manufacturing center. No longer would Hong Kong be merely an entrepot filled with trading companies buying and selling. Now, stuff was being made in Hong Kong, in factories scattered all over, from Aberdeen to the New Territories. Textiles, garments, housewares, silk flowers, watches, you name it. Made in Hong Kong was now throwing its hat in the ring. And with these factories being operated inside the territory, now these men running them were in charge of their own destiny and no longer subject to a myriad of supply chain issues caused by one calamity or another in China. So with the influx of all these factory bosses escaping China and fleeing to Hong Kong, where it was safer and where you had unique opportunities, you had the beginnings of the soon ubiquitous Made in Hong Kong label. This establishment of a manufacturing base is going to propel Hong Kong into the top ranks of global export powerhouses. It was these years, also known as the Grantham era, the late 40s and into the 50s, that Hong Kong saw a particularly massive surge of refugees coming from Shanghai. They concentrated themselves in the North Point area west of Taiku Xing and east of Causeway Bay. They used to call this area Xiao Shanghai, or Little Shanghai, because there were so many of them. Sir Run Run Shaw and his family, who we featured in CHP episode 49, he was part of this exodus from Shanghai at this time. Y.K. Pao, the great shipping magnate and philanthropist, who we will be featuring soon as a topic on this China History podcast, he too came at this time. Who else? Uh, C.C. Lee, the grandfather of Hong Kong's entire textile industry. Brand new spinning equipment that he had purchased from America 
with, with all the chaos of the Civil War raging in 1946 and, and inability to obtain an import license for his equipment uh, from Chiang Kai-shek's government, he, he couldn't get the equipment past China customs in Shanghai. So it turned out to be a blessing in disguise, especially for Hong Kong. C.C. Lee had the machines shipped to Hong Kong instead and set up the factory there that laid the foundation for the whole textile industry in Hong Kong. And the other Shanghainese textile magnates of the late 40s who fled China for greener pastures in Hong Kong, they then built on this foundation laid by C.C. Lee. After Shanghai was taken by the PLA in May of 1949, the city abruptly went into sort of a four-decade state of hibernation. The bad old days of the 1920s and 30s, Shanghai were gone for good. That lifestyle, that way of life, that society was plowed under. And this wasn't just bad for gangsters, pimps, and everyone involved in gambling and the skin trade. Plain old hardworking, honest businessmen, too. They knew a bad thing when they saw it. These Shanghai capitalists packed up all their machines, technology, and anything they could carry, and off to Hong Kong they went. And this provided the kindle wood to light the bonfire that would make Hong Kong an industrial and manufacturing world powerhouse. And you surely remember from episode CHP 61, covering the first 12 months of the PRC, almost as soon as the communists set themselves up in China, the Korean War broke out. This would ultimately lead to a U.S.-led blockade that spelled the end of Hong Kong as a window to the outside world for China. The place had been sealed shut and there was going to be no way to carry out any trade with China. In 1949, not everyone believed in the communist dream for a new China. So many people in China bailed, and it was to Hong Kong that they came, most of them becoming the working poor who were part of the made in Hong Kong miracle happening in all these industrial estates. It wasn't just these entrepreneurs who made things happen. It was the formula of the manufacturers and the bottomless pool of cheap but skilled and hardworking labor pouring in from China. In those bad old days right after the war and into the 1950s, those factories in Hong Kong were total sweatshops of the worst kind. They were no worse than those in England during the Industrial Revolution. Cheap labor poured in regularly. There was never any shortage of asses to sit on stools 18 hours a day at mill to make any number of household items for export. Polystyrene won't get invented to the late 50s, so the toy business hasn't taken off yet. That'll come later. And of course, it's toys, perhaps more than anything else, that Hong Kong made a worldwide name for themselves, an industry. There was plenty of concern in 1949 that Chairman Mao was going to seize Hong Kong back. This was one of the fairs of the day. PLA troops were down there, and certainly if they wanted to, could have crossed the border at Law Wu and just waltzed in, just like the Japanese had done in December of 1941. As tense as it got sometimes, nothing ever happened, ever. Actually, the PLA never needed to invade Hong Kong in order to take it over. Nonetheless, in December 1948, the British Foreign Office, predicting an inevitable victory by the communists in China, said that living in Hong Kong would be comparable to living on the edge of a volcano. Since the Opium Wars, the uneasy relationship between Hong Kong and China had always been one of mutual benefit. Regardless of the historical baggage, having Hong Kong was actually much better than not having Hong Kong. Not only was this true from a government and diplomatic standpoint, but also for the common people as well. It wasn't just the entrepreneurial class and workers who fled to Hong Kong who prospered. The other less mentioned beneficiaries of Hong Kong were the relatives of those who had gone to live in Hong Kong. These hard-working, industrious, common folk who came to Hong Kong became a godsend to their China relatives back in the old country, who not only received money from them, but more importantly, things that were unobtainable in the PRC after 1949 and into the 50s and 60s. If you had a relative in Hong Kong, 
you were considered lucky. By March of 1950, Hong Kong's population was around 2,360,000. The Civil War was over and the state of affairs with the KMT fleeing to Taiwan was just in its infancy. While the violence and fighting may have stopped, the Civil War continued. And what Berlin became for the Allies and the Soviets... That's what Hong Kong became between the nationalists in Taiwan and the communists on the mainland. Secret agents were all over the place. Even the CIA having Hong Kong to operate in, right on the border with the PRC, who back then was our arch enemy. This was a bonanza as far as intelligence was concerned. Not many people know this, but the U.S. government, especially the CIA and the U.S. military, they really leaned on the British you know, as far as Hong Kong was concerned. The newly improved, brash, post-war American frame of mind was really making itself heard. And they leaned hard on Governor Grantham, you know, as far as what they wanted him to do, you know, whatever American interests were concerned, which wasn't just about everything. So the British government in Hong Kong always had the Americans leaning hard on them. And of course, the British wanted to show they were on board with everything the Americans wanted. But at the same time, they had to tell their American partners, hey man, i got to deal with these guys to the north. You know, If I do this for you, then I'm going to you know, catch heat from Chairman Mao. So they really walked a tightrope trying to please and manage the diplomacy of both the U.S. and China. For example, in 1957, after all this talk had been going around the highest levels in Great Britain, about giving the PRC a seat at the United Nations, Eisenhower cut a deal with, you know, Selwyn Lloyd, the British Foreign Secretary at the time, which basically said, we'll lend a helping hand to Hong Kong with our Far East military might and ensure Hong Kong's security. And you, Great Britain, you lay off any of this crazy talk about giving Chairman Mao a seat at the U.N., you know, when they shook hands on this. So stuff like this happened all throughout the 50s and into the 60s. Governor Grantham always had to listen to the Chinese propaganda that, you know, accused the British of allowing the American imperialists to use Hong Kong as a base from which to spy on China. And, of course, the Brits being the stooges of the Americans. I guess, you know, British were rightfully freaking out that Mao had prevailed on the mainland and the USG wanted to make sure they could get the full benefit of Hong Kong's strategic location in the south of China, so close to one of China's largest cities, Guangzhou. This is going to cause all kinds of conflicts and kerfuffles like you can't imagine between the United States and Great Britain. Man, the shoe was on the other foot now, 180 years before. Britain was the colonial master of the U.S., and now in the 1950s, the Americans were bossing the British around. Under Grantham, a whole slew of changes happened. As I said, the doors were flung open for positions in the government administration and civil service. The government carried out a vigorous policy of local recruitment. Grantham had to face the problem of all the refugees who flooded into Hong Kong, particularly right after the fall of Canton, or Guangzhou, in October 1949. After that happened, there were an extra 700,000 mouths to feed in Hong Kong. And where were all these people going to live? I'll tell you where. If they didn't have any money or rich relatives to look after them, these newly arrived Chinese lived in these shanty towns in the hills, the open spaces, wherever they could find 100 square feet to make their own. Christmas Day, 1953. Bad day for the residents living in the squatter villages and Shek Kip May, 53,000 people were left homeless after a fire raged through one of the bigger shanty towns there. The fire killed some, but not many. But 53,000 homeless in the cold, wet December of Hong Kong was a major headache for the Hong Kong government, not to mention all those who lived through the tragedy. How did Grantham deal with this problem? This is where the whole idea of the housing estates began. Thus was born the first ever housing estate, the Shekkit May Estate. Today, in 2013, Shekkit May Estate consists of 26 apartment blocks of 7,363 units, ranging in size from about 110 to 550 square feet. 
This was Hong Kong's first government housing estate. Now, mind you, when they first went up, many outsiders who saw them considered these apartments glorified prison cells. Yeah, they weren't so pretty back then and were meant to serve a kind of utilitarian purpose more than anything else. What people got was, as one observer put it, quote, a concrete box allowing 24 square feet ahead in a seven-story structure with no lifts, no windows, but wooden shutters, no water, but access to communal kitchens and bathrooms. If this sounds dreadful, it was. But such was the alternative, that people fought to get into the new blocks where you had your own place, legally, and it would not burn down, unquote. This wasn't a bad idea, taking all this sprawl over so much land and stacking it up into, you know, these high-rises. This opened up lots of good land for developers. And wherever land developers went, there was plenty of revenue generated for the government coffers. Win-win. The Hong Kong government aggressively embarked on social welfare schemes and in education. They did this through the auspices of existing social welfare agencies, and of course many of the churches and other religious institutions were called upon by the government to assist in the organizing and execution of some services. So these resettlement projects, of which these massive housing estates were the centerpiece, brought a degree of comfort and integration into Hong Kong society for hundreds of thousands of newly arrived Chinese. Sir Patrick Abercrombie, the man called upon to lead the charge for the post-war urban planning in London, delivered a report upon his visit to Hong Kong in 1947. The bullet points Abercrombie gave as far as his recommendations for Hong Kong were to pay attention to zoning, build more wide open spaces, remove traces of the military from central, and last but not least, Abercrombie suggested to build some sort of a cross-harbor tunnel. And anyone familiar with Hong Kong today can see all of these proposals from Abercrombie were taken to heart. Today there are three cross-harbor tunnels for cars and for the red and purple lines of the MTR subway system and the lines to the airport at Lantau. And no one can complain that there are not enough parks and wide open spaces to escape the sprawl and the overcrowding. Into the 1950s and 60s, the working poor toiled away the hours at these factories. It became such a common fact of life to be involved in this world. You know, most of these factories were not these huge Orwellian metropolis type giant factories with assembly lines with a thousand workers. The overwhelming majority of these Hong Kong factories were small operations employing 50 to 100 workers. Many were even smaller. And it wasn't just the workers who got in on the game. Just like you have in China today, back in the 1950s, 60s, in Hong Kong, there developed an entire layer of subcontractors. These subcontractors didn't speak a word of English and could never dream of selling anything to anyone who didn't speak Cantonese. Their world was to supply semi-finished parts and piecework to a much bigger factory who you know, couldn't be bothered with such labor-intensive handwork. Some factory who made ladies' blouses, for example, might have an order for some blouse with some fancy ribbon and bow pinned to it or some embellishment. Maybe for this factory guy to take the time to tie these ribbons might slow him down, or perhaps it was some step in the production that required a particular higher degree of hand labor. The factory might go to some guy he knows, maybe a relative, maybe someone introduced to him, and this guy specializes in tying ribbons and bows. He will handle this at his sweatshop somewhere, and when he's done, he'll deliver the semi-finished goods to the factory who will take this and, you know, finish off the blouse, and then away it goes. Made in Hong Kong. Just like now, nobody was regulating or checking up on these thousands and thousands and thousands of small subcontractors. This is where whole Hong Kong families would get in on the game. Not only would mom and pop do this kind of stuff at their day jobs at the factory, it was entirely common to bring work home. And all the able-bodied kids in the family, grandma too, if she could, would help out. This was pure, unadulterated child labor. 
But this is what people in Hong Kong did in the 50s and 60s. And having the whole family helping out was just the thing that was done in that culture. When the chips were down, everyone stuck together and weathered the hardship together. And if it meant brothers and sisters, 10 years old, sitting around the apartment after dinner, tying bows, gluing rhinestones, folding instruction sheets, counting tiny things and putting them in small boxes, whatever. The family had to survive, and this was just one way they did it. And this whole network that evolved of factories and subcontractors providing that solid fuel that powered the rocket that led to so much of the prosperity in Hong Kong and made the place a force to reckon with. One of the upshots of this, however, was that the labor movement remained weak and toothless. And all the people who fought for workers' rights, safety, pay, benefits, with such an endless supply of labor flowing in from China all the time, always willing to work for peanuts, the labor movement always faced an uphill struggle. But by 1971, bear in mind, the Hong Kong factory worker was ranked second in Asia as far as standard of living went. Hong Kong society was no longer dominated by the British tycoons and bankers and government officials. A combination of Hong Kong's middle class, or upper middle class, however you want to call it, along with all those rich Chinese industrialists who were the anchors of Hong Kong industry, combined to become a rather formidable force. The days during the times of all those old governors, Bowring, Robinson, McDonald, Kennedy, Hennessy... Those days when the British truly did lord it over the Chinese in Hong Kong, those days couldn't have been more over. And looked at from the prism of where Hong Kong was in the 50s and 60s, they seemed quite anachronistic. Besides all this, there was the whole matter of Hong Kong's relationship with China. That is, Britain's relationship with China. For Britain in the 1950s, there was no more... Dao Guang or Guangxu Emperor to deal with. Now it was Chairman Mao on the Dragon Throne, so to speak. China wasn't as powerful as they are today, but nonetheless, the British government knew the old tried-and-true playbook of propping up a weak and rotting government and exploiting it for national gain had to be thrown out. Actually, Britain knew all this, and they bent over backwards to show the CCP they meant no harm and had every intention to be a good neighbor down in the South. A lot of symbolic steps and actions were taken to give you know, certain authorities and power to China regarding sensitive issues that concerned both Hong Kong and China. Britain was one of the first non-Warsaw Pact nations to recognize the PRC, doing so in February of 1950. The interesting thing about the relationship between China and Hong Kong was that even though the place was a British colony or territory, they were now calling it, China considered the matter of Hong Kong as a domestic matter rather than a foreign policy matter. Hong Kong had its uses now as it had from the earliest founding days of the CCP. The Korean War that began in June 1950 created all manners of diplomatic complications for the British with respect to Hong Kong. The British, of course, were part of the UN force fighting the Chinese in the frozen Korean Peninsula, British diplomats really had to work overtime during that time to keep the pot from boiling over with China until things quieted down in July 1953. But during the Korean War period, as I said, the UN and the US slapped an embargo on trade with China and Hong Kong being part of Britain and all. They had to comply also. But as I explained... As soon as this embargo, you know, that could have meant curtains for Hong Kong, as soon as it came into force, along comes the birth of Hong Kong industrial might to rescue the economy and the people's livelihoods. Into the 1960s, the progress Hong Kong made in industry was having a rather large effect on Hong Kong society. Although workers didn't make what could be called a living wage, a lot of people were working. And the way it was within the Cantonese family, everyone stuck together and looked out for one another. So even though you weren't bringing in a big income, one always had that familial safety net under them. So you could say society was doing well. For sure, it was more pleasant in Hong Kong than in China. The decade of the 60s opened up with horrific 
and deadly famines that came as a result of the Great Leap Forward. This brought in more refugees who were escaping for their lives. 150,000 refugees came in 1962 alone. Hong Kong's population in the 60s hovered around 3 million. Thanks to Sir Run Run Shaw, the Shaw Brothers, and all the other Hong Kong entertainment moguls, there was plenty to watch on TV, and this provided endless distraction from the rigors of life. Connie Chan was the huge TV and movie star of the day and all the rage back in the 60s. Hong Kong TV came into its own during this time. Most of you have seen, or at least heard, of the book made into a 1960 Hollywood movie called The World of Susie Wong. This starred a 42-year-old William Holden uh, together with 21-year-old Nancy Kwan. Guan Jia Qian. Nancy Kwan was born in Hong Kong to a Chinese father and a Scottish mother. She grew up in Kowloon Tong and went through all the traumas of the Japanese occupation and the Civil War as a young child. She had a very complicated childhood, but she had the looks and the talent and got herself spotted at the right time. This novel by Richard Mason was a big hit around the world, but the movie, besides making Nancy Kwan a household name back then and for many years after, it did wonders for boosting Hong Kong's image as an International, swinging, hip, exotic location filled with all the wonders of Chinese culture. And, of course, beautiful, innocent local women just dying to be swept up by some dashing guaylo. I mean, foreigner. The Beatles arrived in Hong Kong June 8th, 1964. There, they played two shows at the Princess Theatre in Jim Sa Joy. The Princess Theatre isn't around anymore. It was torn down, and today the site is occupied by the Miramar Hotel on Nathan and Kimberly Roads. The hotel they stayed at isn't there anymore either. They stayed at the old Hyatt Regency on Nathan, which back in the Beatlemania days was the newly opened President Hotel. The Fab Four played two shows on June 9th. Neither of them sold out because the ticket prices at 75 Hong Kong dollars was about a week's pay for the average working stiff. Ringo, by the way, didn't make it to Hong Kong as he was sick uh, for this part of the tour. This was the brief window where Jimmy Nickel filled in for Ringo, writing himself into the rock and roll history books. The Cantonese language press totally panned the performance, and pretty much like everywhere the Beatles played in Asia, they were considered a corrupting influence on the youth of the day. As a quick sidebar to this sidebar, Back in 1964, in order for John Paul George and Jimmy Nickel to get uh, to Hong Kong from London, they had to make fueling stops in Zurich, Beirut, Karachi, Calcutta, and Bangkok. There were no non-stoppers back then. Writer and James Bond 007 creator Ian Fleming, he wrote of Hong Kong in the 1960s that it was, quote, the most vivid and exciting city I have ever seen, offering comfort in a theatrically oriental setting. It was a gay and splendid colony, humming with vitality and progress. Knowing that 650 million communist Chinese are a few miles away, across the frontier, seems only to add zest to the excitement at all levels of life in the colony. And from the governor down, if there is an underlying tension... There is certainly no dismay. Obviously, China could take Hong Kong by a snap of its giant fingers, but China has shown no signs of wishing to do so. Whatever the future holds, there is no sign that a sinister, doom-fraught countdown is in progress. Unquote. Fleming here is referring to the countdown to July 1st, 1997, when the lease on the new territories would expire. Things were all peaceful and rosy in Hong Kong in the 1960s. There were riots in 1966 that covered three days of protest. It all began when the Hong Kong government proposed raising fares on the Star Ferry 25% from 20 cents to 25 cents. Back then, the Star Ferry was the only way to get from Kowloon to Hong Kong Island. Hong Kong was still 
seven years away from opening up the first Cross Harbor Tunnel, which took you from Hong Hum to Causeway Bay. I guess the theme of today's China History Podcast episode is the rise and dominance of Hong Kong industrial might and what it meant for Hong Kong. You see, this is all linked together with the 1966 riots. Not to be confused with the bigger and more famous 1967 riots, which we'll get to next time. As Hong Kong manufacturing grew, it brought in all kinds of money into the territory. The problem was that, although Hong Kong was booming, workers' wages were remaining flat. You know the problem. Too much labor. Too many Hong Kong people already, and more arriving every day from China. So there was never a moment like you have today in China where suddenly labor wasn't plentiful enough. In China today, it's not so easy to find workers to keep these factories humming. Because of this, and along with government policy, wages are going up like crazy. Well, no such luck for Hong Kong's workers in the 1960s. They still worked for the same peanuts as always. It seemed okay in the 1950s. After all, those were such... Extraordinary times, the blowback from the Chinese Civil War, the Korean War, the persecution of the intellectuals and capitalists, the Great Leap Forward, the famine. But now, it was the 1960s, man, groovy, and the common Hong Kong workers were seeing all these same changes as everyone else and all these nice things in life, and they didn't have no Hong Kong $75 to go see the Beatles at the Princess Theater. This class of society was barely making ends meet and not getting their meager rations of the Hong Kong economic and industrial miracle. Over half a million squatters were still living on the hillsides of Kowloon. This and all the income disparity, lousy working conditions, zero political representation, and disgust at the government corruption, there already was this slow boil of discontent already simmering. So when word got out, as it always did in Hong Kong, that people who used the Star Ferry to get to work had to face a 25% increase, they went crazy. 25% increase coming and going? What the? Actually, the government wanted to raise it even higher. So April 4th, 1966. Ten years later, on this very date, you'll see the first Tiananmen incident, which we discussed before. A guy named So Sao Zhong, or Su Shou Zhong, in Mandarin. He got the ball rolling when he sat his ass down at the Star Ferry Terminal on the central side and began a hunger strike. He famously wore a vest that said, Hail Elsie! Join the hunger strike to block the fare increase! Now, for those who are not familiar with Hong Kong, the Star Ferry Terminal in Central, in the old days, before the days of the IFC and Exchange Square, was about as public of a place as you could get. It was akin to Grand Central Station in New York City. You had a lot of people coming and going at all hours of the day. So, Mr. So got maximum value for his protest, and I guess the timing was right in 1966. People by that time who were watching all this prosperity going on right before their eyes, finally reached a point where they had had enough. And the idea of protesting this fair increase caught fire quickly. Hail Elsie. That was Elsie Elliott they were talking about. Those who lived in Hong Kong in the 80s and 90s remember her as Elsie too. Why was Mr. So wearing this vest with the words Hail Elsie on it? Mrs. Elliott too who, may I preface this by saying, was ranked by a 1993 South China Morning Post poll as Hong Kong's most widely admired personality. She was a nice old lady from Newcastle who moved to Hong Kong in 1951 at the age of 38, and pretty much Elsie fought for the common man, you know, one of those types, the bane of the establishment, always fighting for the fair deal for the common folk. For decades until she retired from public service, Elsie, too, fought against government corruption, against the triads, and for fair treatment of workers and against colonialism. She set up a school for children living in the shanty towns of Guntong in 1954 and served as the principal. This is the kind of work she did. Nothing flashy, just trying to help the poor. 
she drifted into politics, and when the whole Star Fairy rate increase thing came up, she fought against it. She went out into the hood and drummed up 20,000 signatures on a petition against the fare increase. The government felt, what, five cents? What's the big deal? And LC2, well, back then, she was still LC Elliott. She knew this was a big deal and meant 50 cents extra a week out of the pockets of the people who lived a life where every penny counted. She even flew to London to complain. When the vote came up in government, only Elsie voted against it. The lone dissenter. That's why Mr. So was hailing Elsie. So, 1966 riots, it happened real fast. Mr. So, in a familiar scene we've read about for so many decades, was of course arrested and sentenced, which led to more outbreaks of protest. April 6th, right there on Nathan Road, riots broke out. Protesters threw rocks at buses and Vehicles were set alight. The police station in Yaomate was attacked by a mob. This led to the usual police show of force, complete with tear gas and everything. The mob grew into the night as, you know, people out for a stroll on Nathan Road or exiting the movie theaters when they let out. They joined in to show their disapproval of this fare increase. They called in the army to deal with this, so you had uniformed soldiers with fixed bayonets on their rifles, Right there on the streets of Jim Sa Joy, Jordan, Yaoma Day, and Mong Kok, curfews were called for the next day. And after the usual suspects were all rounded up, 669 in all, the curfew was lifted on April 10th, and this tempest in a teapot simmered down. In the end, 258 protesters received prison sentences of up to two years, and Several million dollars damage was done in the mayhem. And despite all the protest and the riots that followed, and despite Elsie Elliott II's best efforts, the fear increase went through anyway, and that was that. Elsie also got herself censured by the government for provoking the whole incident, and from that point on was viewed as a classic political troublemaker. Today, as I speak, I believe taking the Star Ferry across Hong Kong Harbor in first class will set you back $2.50 Hong Kong and $2 on the lower deck, which at $0.32 cents and $0.25 cents USD is one of the many true bargains left in this world. So Hong Kong dodged a bullet with this riot, it lasted less than a week, and was contained rather quickly. Next time when we pick up with Part 9 of this Hong Kong history overview. We'll look at the 1966 riots, more famous brother, the 1967 riots. That was an incident that anyone born, say, 1960 or later in Hong Kong might remember quite vividly. So that will be saved for next time. And once we finish with the 67 riots, it's on to the 70s, 80s, and we'll finish off in 1997, like I said. For now, as usual, this is your kind and humble narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, coming to you from very cold but sunny Claremont, California, here on the easternmost edge of Los Angeles County. We're here for you each and every 10 days to two weeks or sometimes longer with a dose of Chinese history and culture. And so far, still a free service at the ChinaHistoryPodcast.com. I thank you all for listening, and if I was able to pique your interest enough, then I hope we'll see you next week for perhaps another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.